This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, the weekly show where we are not afraid to tackle and read and review important books, usually in economics, but sometimes in history and political theory and all kinds of subjects. And last week, we uh, were able to cover Rothbard's uh, America's Great Depression, which was really fun, a lot of good history there. And we really enjoyed going through that book, or I certainly enjoyed going through that book. And so this week, in somewhat the same vein, we're going through another uh, Rothbard book, The Case Against the Fed. And much like America's Great Depression, it is one where he combines his uh, seemingly insatiable knowledge of history with also some mechanics and technical economics. So The Case Against the Fed is a very slim volume. It's just a little bit over 100 pages. Uh, so in that sense, it is uh, a bit like what has government done to our money? But it's also, I think, a little bit more interesting and technical than that book. So here to join us uh, to work through, this is our great friend and senior fellow, Mark Thornton. So, hey, Mark, good morning. Hey, Jeff. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me to discuss this book with you. Well, I want to just lay out a couple particulars for people. First of all, The Case Against the Fed is available on our website, Mises.org. Just enter Case Against the Fed in the search engine, and you can find a beautiful HTML format, which is even searchable, I believe. You can also find a PDF. Uh, the book's very cheap in paperback, I believe $7 at our website. So I want to first encourage that. But the other thing I wanted to mention, Mark, was that this may be really the last substantive book-length thing that Murray wrote. He wrote this in the mid in 1994, or at least completed it in 94. He died then in January of 95. And he actually wrote this for the Mises Institute. We were the publisher. Yes. And it's a, it's a great work. It's a tour de force. And you get an incredibly dense amount of information in an entertaining fashion um, in a little over 100 pages. And look what you get. You get um, 30, 40 pages, which brings you up to steam in terms of money and banking. So instead of taking a course in money and banking, you can just read 30 or 40 pages and you get all the essentials, uh, everything from the evolution of money to banking. Um, it's just wonderful. And then also, as you read through this book, you get um, a course on American economic history, which you otherwise wouldn't have any access to. Uh, traditional American economic history texts uh, give you the American point of view, essentially. Uh, this gives you a more realistic point of view uh, and that basically, you know, a lot of Americans have recently come to know that what government is doing to us now is largely a scam. You know, the bailouts, the lockdowns, the virus, um, all of this stuff that's been happening to us, slowly but surely more Americans are learning that this is all a scam. Well, Murray Rothbard shows us that there's these scams going on throughout American history. So it, it really brings us up, you know, right to the present. And the most important central point that Rothbard raises, I think, throughout the text is that the Fed is not in the business of fighting inflation. That's the cover story. What actually is going on is the Fed is creating inflation. And as it gains power, uh, its ability to inflate the money supply has ever increased. Yeah, what's interesting is in the introduction, he talks about how ridiculous it is to think that the private sector is out there clamoring for inflation and, and that if left to its own devices, this would be the natural course. He said, you know, on the contrary. Yeah, it's a complete lie. Um, you know, the, the whole purpose of the Fed is to be able to increase the money supply to allow banks to increase uh, their assets uh, without any constraint. And that cover story basically is all a lie. The Fed is the cartel device that allows banks to inflate their assets um, at will. And if they ever get in any trouble, of course, the Fed is right there to bail them out. Well, one thing I liked about this book in particular is that uh, although 1994 is quite a while ago, it, it's, it's certainly more current than all the stuff he was writing about money in the 60s, for example. And so the Fed's balance sheet at the time he's writing this book, its liabilities is 400 some billion. And that actually m maintained fairly steady up until the crash of, of 08. So the balance sheet didn't rise all that much between 94 and 94. 
and 2007. So there's, you know, there's, it's, it's the numbers are, of course, have exploded since, both in terms of the debt side and the, uh, the Fed's balance sheet. But it's, it's interesting to read that. The other thing I really liked in the intro was he talks about Henry Gonzalez and Barney Frank, who were both members of Congress, prominent members of Congress in 94. And of course, uh, when Ron Paul got back into Congress, uh, after the 96 election in 97, you know, he he served with both of them. Barney Frank was, of course, very friendly to Ron and always gave him uh, his due on the banking committee and, and was respectful to Ron's criticisms of the Fed. So I thought that was interesting. But also the fact that Henry Gonzalez, a Democrat, a, a, a Texas Democrat who was always very well dressed, by the way, uh, he had some really some very mild and milk toast reforms uh, aimed at, at creating more transparency uh, for voters and for, for lay people with the Fed. And one of them is that we ought to have a real audit, not just a de facto uh, audit of what the Fed owns on its balance sheet at the end of the year, but some, some audit into its actual rate setting functions and some transparency and visibility. And at the time, the maestro, Alan Greenspan, said, no, 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 the, the Fed is independent. We can't have this sort of tinkering and so even these modest reforms were, were shot down and, and failed in Congress. Yes, 1994 is now the good old days in terms of the Fed and its power and its balance sheet. Um, things seemed much more manageable uh, and more disposable back then. And, you know, people were actually talking about reforms and transparency um, at the Fed, trying to bring back power to the people, so to speak, and, and less power, less authority, less independence for the Federal Reserve. And I think that if we had achieved some of those mild reforms, we might not have gotten into the position we are today with a Fed that is just co totally out of control, totally monetizing the debt uh, and all these bailout packages, basically, you know, where the Fed is infallible and all powerful. Well, I was struck that it wasn't all that long ago that the left in this country uh, viewed the Fed with some trepidation as an instrument or a tool of the rich, and that seems to have disappeared. Yes, it has. And, you know, modern monetary theory, of course, is, is new on the scene, and it's been embraced by the left so that uh, basically uh, they can carry out all of their agenda in terms of the Green New Deal uh, welfare for all, basic income, uh, right on down the list because you don't. There's no constraint on the budget anymore, and so the left can do whatever it wants. Uh, the government borrows the money, and the Fed monetizes it, and so it's like magic. the The left has discovered this tool, uh, first put forth on by the right, and um, hopefully they don't get the power to actually do that. But it's de facto in existence already. I always thought that the Fed and central banking would be a great crossover populist issue where left and right could find some commonality. But and, and when I say left, I shouldn't speak too glibly, right? The left isn't monolithic. And there are people on the left, uh, critics like Nomi Prinz, for example, who's not uh, altogether convinced that the Fed is working in the interests of the little guy. But there's also, I think, deep hypocrisy. Like, for instance, the Congressional Black Caucus has been uh, – exceedingly uh, pro-Fed because ostensibly this helps, you know, first-time uh, buyers and low-income people get into homes. And so this was their big song around 07. And, and what we saw was that a lot of black folks bought homes and then lost them uh, in the crash. So, so I, you know, there, there's it's kind of a, a mixed bag. But what, what's great about this book, I think, as you mentioned, is, is you get this really in, in 100 odd short pages, this, this walk through, this tour de force of, and, and it starts out with a nice little Mengarian treatment of the origins of money, how it arises as a commodity, how it solves barter, but also how it allows us to calculate. As he points out, imagine if at the end of the month you spent, you know, 10 chickens and four goats and two grains of wheat or two bushels of wheat, and you've got, uh, you know, uh, five pearls and uh, seven uh, ears of corn. So how would you ever calculate without a, 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 a universally or at least widely accepted medium? Well, there's always hope for that populist crossover movement to reestablish itself. It's come up uh, through time uh, in the 19th century and in the 20th century. You know, people on the left and the populist movements uh, of the past have come to look at monetary reform as really very important. So I think that's has a potential to reemerge 
uh, again, and I think it's very important um, that stuff that you mentioned about Menger and the evolution and emergence of money on the marketplace and solving the problems of barter, all of those things are have to be exposed to the general public because right now the general public doesn't really have a firm grasp on terms of what is money, what it does for us. Uh, they just have a very glib view of money and why do I have so little of it and why do others have so much of it? Well, that's a separate and distinct problem. But once people understand the basics of money and what it does and the problems it can cause in terms of rising prices, in terms of the business cycle, in terms of economic destruction, unemployment, bankruptcy, and so forth, which is sprinkled throughout the text, basically, that these are problems that are caused by problems with money, uh, then you really have the potential for the reemergence of this populist monetary reform movement to be reestablished. In the past, of course, uh, in the leading up to the establishment of the Fed, of course, the arguments, the public arguments were manufactured and artificial um, on behalf of the large New York City banks. So we have to take that back. Well, in the middle of this book, he gets into a, a brief discussion of monetarism and the quantity theory of money, especially at page 25. And he brings up of course, uh, someone you studied in depth, the uh, French economist Richard Cantillon, and uh, d discusses the lack of neutrality of money. And so Rothbard, it, which is typical, I think, manages to, to bring up the moral component of all this. Absolutely. Uh, Richard Cantillon and the, his essay uh, dating back to 1730, very similar to Rothbard, condense, precise, treatment of issues that other people had not really studied or even had a firm grasp of. And, you know, issues like the naive quantity theory of money are dealt with by Cantillon and Rothbard in a very straightforward uh, fashion. Uh, they both expose the fallacies of the mechanical view uh, of the quantity theory of money and what's really going on and the real disturbances that we otherwise can't see. And that's really important is economics allows us to understand those things that we cannot see. And in particular here, Rothbard brings up the Cantillon effects in that if you expand the money supply, you change relative income, you change relative prices, and therefore you change relative incomes. Somebody is being enriched in the process of expanding the money supply, particularly the government and those in the banks and those who get the money first, and everybody else is disadvantaged. They lose relative wealth and income uh, in that process. They're impoverished because they can't buy as much of goods and services with their incomes that they used to be able to do. So again, economic theory on the part of Rothbard and Cantillon and others uh, exposes what we otherwise can't see and allows us to understand uh, things that we can't see. Well, and the morality, of course, is intertwined with property rights themselves. A lot of this is hidden, as you mentioned, and, and, and so when relative incomes and relative purchasing power are changed by either a government or central bank uh, rapidly or perhaps unnaturally increasing the money supply, what, what happens is a form of, of enrichment and, and theft. But we tend to not think about it or understand it that way. We tend to view, oh, these central banks are sort of technical, you know, making technical changes and things, not moral changes. Yes, that's right. And um, one of the things uh, here is that's really important for everybody to understand, and Rothbard really drives it home here as well as Cantillon did, is that the amount of money in an economy is sufficient to basically do all transactions. You don't have to increase the supply of money to, for us to be a bigger economy or more prosperous. Any supply of money will do the task. And so, you know, it's embedded in most people's thinking that the Fed is there to increase the money supply at a regulated rate, mm. you know, so it's doing a technical service when actuality is that um, it's uh, robbing some people and enriching other people. And that's really the moral aspect of this uh, issue is that it hurts the economy overall. But in terms of who wins and who loses, there's 
definite people who win and there's definite people who lose in the process of expanding the money supply. And Rothbard points out very uh, clearly that any quantity of money, uh, the existing quantity of money will do and that if it, you know, over time, you will get increases in the supply of money as uh, the purchasing power of money increases, it will increase the incentives for people to go out and dig up more money, basically. And so there's a natural increase in the money supply that grows very slowly, but any supply of money will actually do the trick in terms of the functioning of the economy. So it's not the supply per se, it's a rapid increase or decrease in the supply. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the thing about money and its purchasing power is uh, that it's relatively stable. And early on in human history, human society uh, used and developed a lot of different things to serve as money, things like salt and shells and, you know, animals, uh, crops, dates, walnuts, and, and so on. Uh, but over time, the properties of money that were most marketable led human society to things like gold and silver and copper, which were homogeneous, which were highly valued relative to size, so they were easily transportable. And so those properties um, of gold and silver and copper uh, won out in the world marketplace, essentially. And of course, eventually people learned to coin money so that you had individual homogenous units of money. And so, you know, through most of human history, thousands of years BC, um, on up into uh, the Middle Ages, basically, money was a commodity. Uh, it became coined a couple thousand BC, and it basically allowed the flourishing of human society. And uh, you could view government money and uh, central banks as a parasite on that beautiful flourishing of human society. So in the middle of this book, he gets into his treatment of deposit banking, which we might also refer to, or he does refer to as money warehousing. And this idea that when you deposit money, that ought to create a bailment contract, much like when you pawn something at the pawn shop, as opposed to a debtor creditor relationship, which is how, you know, if you go get a checking account at B of A tomorrow, that's how it actually works. So, uh, how did we get so off track here? And, and are you 100% in agreement with his criticisms of fractional reserve? Well, <laughs> I know this is a can of worms, yeah. I, but it's, and it's beyond perhaps the scope of this book, but it, I think it, it plays a key role in this book. Well, as you, you know, go through time, um, you know, money is a valuable commodity, obviously, and so people want to protect that money. And the best way that they could protect that money was to deposit it in a money warehouse, uh, the safe of a goldsmith or the vault of a bank. There you could safely store your money. And then, of course, we learned over time that we could use uh, certificates of various sorts um, to transfer money from one owner to another, from one bank to another, from one country to another. So we they developed uh, bank notes to represent your deposits um, in banks. There were bills of exchange that people could do international trade, uh, which is, of course, a very important to the flourishing of humanity. And so that large amounts of money could be easily transferred over long distances. And those were incredibly important uh, to the development of international trade. Um, you know, at a fundamental level, when you go to fractional reserve banking, where the bank doesn't necessarily hold um, all of uh, your gold in equality with the amount of paper certificates that it issues. It's, you know, banknotes and uh, things of that nature. That's when you get into a lot of trouble. Uh, first of all, you're expanding the money supply, so it induces all of the problems we've already discussed. Uh, but of course, it also opens up the opportunity, not really an opportunity, but the possibility of banks failing, of them, of depositors trying to access their money at one time, uh, whether it's based on the fragility of the bank itself or events in the real world, such as war, and people want to actually have their money on their person. And then it, we find out that the bank doesn't actually have uh, enough gold or silver in order to meet all of these requirements for withdrawals 
uh, from the economy. And so this is a whole different problem of bank collapse, uh, basically, where uh, the bank collapses, it can't meet its requests for their deposits. Uh, and as a consequence, it causes chaos between the bank and all of its depositors and all of their businesses. You know, I mentioned earlier that Rothbard always brings history into things. And I think the historical treatment he gives us here, not only of the Bank of England and central banking more generally, but also specifically the U.S. Fed, is so important because we tend to believe these sanitized versions of how institutions come into being when, in fact, there's often uh, really some sort of low and mean impulses behind their creation. And, and we certainly find that here. I mean, he starts out, Mark, with the Bank of England in the late 1600s. I mean, that's a long time ago. And what struck me is even back then, his description of the purpose of central banks rings so true today. Let me just read it for people real quickly. This is actually at page 58 of the book. He says, uh, and he's talking about the Bank of England. So we're talking you know, hundreds of years ago. The central bank has always had two major roles. One, to help finance the government's deficit, and two, to cartelize the private commercial banks in the country so as to help remove the two great market limits on their expansion of credit. That's That sounds absolutely true today. Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, the Bank of England, 1694, uh, basically England had gone through a period of civil unrest and civil war, you know, in terms of trying to consolidate their power um, and tax the people. And at that point, they were basically, uh, the, the government itself was bankrupt, and yet it had a lot of wishes it wanted to do. It wanted to suppress the French. It wanted to expand the empire. Uh, note the time here, you know, before the American Revolution, uh, the English were, were doing a lot of things all over the world, and they needed money to do it. So a Scottish promoter came to them with the idea of, you know, you give me a monopoly on the issue of banknotes, and you guarantee that you deposit all of your revenues with my bank, and I'll issue notes sufficient enough to cover your debt and to increase your expenditures to go to war with France, which it did less than a decade later. And, you know, you had the War of Spanish Succession, which was war throughout Europe, basically, uh, for a period of more than 10 years. And so that's that's really what it all boils down to is that the a central bank in general can uh, cover the debts of the government, and it also simultaneously, uh, eventually at least, provides for a cartelizing device uh, for the banking system because, of course, the central bank is fragile, and uh, the banks below it are going to be also fragile. So they all have to be managed in a cartel so that no one uh, bank is going out on its own. Um, and it, so there's, um, you know, certain limitations that apply here. Boy, that's a whole nother topic, isn't it? War finance and central banks. I'm not sure we could have broad scale world wars without them. No, absolutely not. Mises, you know, the ultimate medalist uh, basically uh, said that with a real gold standard, it, it handcuffs the government's hands to do outrageous things. And it, it could be war. That's the most, you know, obvious uh, event uh, that is precipitated here, but it could be anything. It could be uh, any type of uh, reckless spending on the part of the government. And all of a sudden, you know, if people see this recklessness, uh, they what do they do? Well, they withdraw their their money from banks, basically, and they, they want to get their money out of the country, so to speak. And so the gold standard, as Mises showed, was the ultimate check on uh, government folly. Yeah, that's sad and tragic to think of. No question about it. I mean, the two two horrific world wars in the 20th century is also the century of central banking. Um, but but if we if enough people recognize this, uh, that itself could precipitate changes which would check uh, these kind of policies. So you know, the, this warfare and this globalism and all of that can be stopped. That's the that's really the the overall key is that we can uh, bring this to an end. Murray says that it's just a matter of will. Once we have the will, we have the way, so to speak, uh, to change all this, to bring it back down to a manageable level um, that not only prevents all this government warfare and so forth, uh, but it also brings stability to society. It allows us to clean up all uh, the other problems that have developed over time in terms of poverty, in terms of 
income distribution that we face today, these things can be solved. And, and it basically boils down to one word, which is will, and will is based on knowledge. Well, I certainly hope so. I hope we have that will, maybe, and we might need it <laughs> as things are, stand. Um, we don't have it yet, but we can have it. That's mm -hmm. the key. And uh, once we realize that we can have it and that it's based on knowledge, you know, this is what makes Rothbard's case against the Fed so powerful and has so much potential. Even though it was written more than 25 years ago, it's very, very incredibly relevant today. Well, part of that case and part of that knowledge is based on the truly sordid background of the creation of the Fed itself. And Rothbard sent spends a good part of this book, sort of mid to late in the book, talking about the history of the Fed itself, talking about the Bank of the United States established by Hamilton. He goes through, you know, Wall Street fat cats basically wanted a central bank in the late 1800s. He goes through a discussion of the Morgan Railroad Empire, the Rockefeller Oil Empires, how these two seemingly ad adversarial uh, families got together the Panic of 07, which is sometimes used as a justification for, you know, needing a central bank. So all of these things, as as usual, and as you would expect if you've read Rothbard's uh, other histories, his progressive era, um, you know, he, he throws in a, a lot of deep understanding that, that helps us, I think, as people, most of our audience are probably people who are dis predisposed to uh, look askance at central banking, even conceptually. Uh, but I think a lot of this historical background is important to give us the ammunition against people who say, well, this was all designed for stability and to help us. Yeah. And people say, oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. But Rothbard, you know, goes into intimate details about how this is all woven together, the power of these large corporations and these large banks. I mean, it's great that we have them, right? I mean, it's it's uh, it's great that we have uh, corporations that can make steel at such a low price. Uh, and facilitate international trade and all this stuff. But ultimately, a lot of these power brokers uh, use their positions and their allies to seek out artificial power outside of the marketplace. And uh, ultimately, they wanted a central bank to manage the, the cartel amongst all of the various combatants. And there's about 20 odd pages of these intimate details. And obviously, you don't have to uh, know and memorize um, all of these details. It's just there so that you know that there really was an historical struggles for government power and the establishment of, uh, of the central bank. And uh, so that's why it's important that it's not just a conspiracy theory that somebody made up. These are intimate details. It would take, it would take me probably 10 years if I tried to reconstruct uh, what Rothbard knew and what he wrote about this period, roughly, of course, it's an ongoing battle. But after the 1896 election, and then the uh, the passage of the Gold Act, which they they wanted a gold standard system, uh, they didn't want silver, and then there was a, a long process, uh, probably um, well more than a decade long process of trying to achieve the Federal Reserve Act that, you know, ultimately came about. And it's a power struggle. You, you can see the intimate details of what went on there. But basically, it was a, a longstanding effort of propaganda on the American public where, you know, these power brokers use third parties, you know, business organizations, uh, type of things to propagandize uh, the American people through uh, so-called research at the University of Chicago and, um, you know, business owners associations throughout the country and then feeding newspapers stories and arguments that why central banking was needed and, you know, why the current system was inadequate. Uh, and then really they just had to wait for power in Washington, D.C. to write uh, legislation in their direction. And then, of course, the panic of uh, 1907 would further enhance their efforts by being an example of what happens if we don't have a central bank. Of course, in addition to all this history, you get Rothbard laying out and helping us understand mechanically what central banks do. And I think this is, this is just so important for people, especially if you have friends or family members 
who really don't understand the Fed or don't have much knowledge of it at all. I mean, this book's a great place to steer him because throughout the book, he actually has examples of T accounts where we've got uh, assets on one side and equity plus liabilities on the other side. And I think at, at page 140 in particular, he lays out sort of the two-step process of monetary expansion, whereby first the Fed acts uh, to expand the holdings of central of, of commercial banks, excuse me, and then the, the step two, those commercial banks turn around and expand uh, the the amount of, of money and credit of sliding around in the system. So I think this is one of the great benefits of this bookmark is it really gives people simple and clear, very Rothbardian explications of how this whole process works in almost a mechanical sense. Yeah, and you get different levels of analysis that some people will, you know, use um, the logical exposition that Rothbard puts forward. Other people will look at the T accounts, the accounting level as the best way of understanding things. And then other people will look at Rothbard's historical examples uh, as the best way to understand this whole process by which the money supply can be manipulated and expanded and directed uh, by the central bank. And of course, nowadays, uh, we're in this great monetization of the government debt where the, the Treasury issues debt, uh, the Fed buys the debt from banks, and that gives banks fewer assets uh, but more money to be able to lend out. And so uh, you get an, a multiple expansion uh, of the money supply based on what the Fed is triggering uh, within the banks in your very hometown, some in some cases, but more likely uh, it originates in the big New York City banks, basically. And uh, the process is all laid out. It's easy to understand. And, you know, when I used to teach money in banking and I'd go through the whole course and students would inevitably come into my office near the final exam and say, you know, we've been reading this stuff. We've been trying to understand it. Uh, we just don't get it. There just seems to be something wrong. And I would have them sit down. I'd say, well, the one thing I didn't mention throughout the course is that basically this is all a scam. And they would look at me like I was going to explain it. But I said, you guys know, you've seen it and you, you just couldn't absorb the fact that you're being scammed. Everybody's being scammed. And that was it. They would just stand up and leave knowing that that was the missing piece. Well, they might uh, go back to their dorm and call their uh, parents and say, "What am I getting here at Auburn? I'm finally fi I finally got uh, a professor tell me what's up." So that's <laughs> that's uh, I, I'm I'm sure Auburn doesn't want you telling them that, but office hours are office hours. So, <laughs> so I want to wrap up this discussion with what absolutely blows me away. The most interesting part of this book, by far, to me, is the just five or six brief pages at the end. Typical Murray Rothbard. It's called "What Can Be Done." And here he actually lays out a mechanical blueprint. Again, it's all about will, political will, but a mechanical blueprint for how we could actually unravel, how we could end the Fed. And I, I just thought that you know, if, if anybody can just take the time to read this and understand what he's talking about, they'll find it absolutely fascinating. Yes, it's, um, it's simple. It's very businesslike. He's uh, canceling assets and liabilities between the Fed and uh, the central government. Um, and he's saying, okay, what assets are left in this bankruptcy or this liquidation uh, of the Fed? And he looks at basically how much gold does the uh, Fed and Treasury possess? And then what are their liabilities in terms of the amount of money or banknotes that have been issued into the economy? And then he just revalues the amount of gold uh, so that Every owner possessor of the liabilities, the banknotes, the money, uh, gets a, a share uh, of that gold supply, those gold hoards uh, at the Fed. And the, the uh, Treasury issues gold coins to redeem the amount of notes that are coming in from the economy to clear the Federal Reserve from the economy. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of minor issues. There are a lot of side issues, but it's basically a straightforward liquidation or bankruptcy. I go through a similar process in my Skyscraper Curse book of how to liquidate the Fed in more up-to-date uh, terms. But it's actually very simple, you know, where most people 
think, well, that's impossible to liquidate. We just have to continue to inflate our way until the whole thing comes crashing down. But no, there's a very logical, straightforward way of addressing this monster in Washington, D.C. and in New York City. So there is a solution, basically, and it's very simple. The consequences may be very difficult, but the process of liquidation is not. Well, for our listeners, I want to just work through a few of these numbers real quickly. So unlike most countries, our Fed does not own gold per se. What it holds on its balance sheet is called a gold certificate account. So since 1934 and the Gold Reserve Act uh, transferred the actual ownership and possession of physical precious metals to the Treasury, although it's it's actually supposedly housed with the U.S. Mint. So uh, when Rothbard writes his book in 94, that gold certificate account is valued at $11 billion on the balance sheet. And that $11 billion is still the same today. That's because in 1973, statutorily gold was set at $42.22 an ounce. So uh, about 260 million ounces are held, again, supposedly by the Treasury. And, and at $42 an ounce, that comes out to about $11 billion. So the 260 million ounces is still the same today. The 11 billion on the Fed's balance sheet is still the same today. But of course, what's changed radically, Mark, and Rothbard talks about letting gold float to its actual market price to help uh, the Fed uh, unwind its liabilities, was when, when Rothbard writes the book, in June of 94, gold's about $387 an ounce. Today, it's about $1,800 an ounce. But boy, oh boy, you know, talk about all the tea in China. Is there enough gold there, 260 million ounces, to unwind all of this? It seems like uh, the numbers have just gotten so enormous that it's almost unthinkable. It seems that way, but it is doable. Um, and who knows? I mean, the price of gold in a couple of years could be $10,000. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as all of this inflation, monetary inflation, works its way through the system, uh, we could see much higher prices for real things like commodities uh, and much lower prices for, for other assets such as stocks and bonds. And so it's a fluid market, but at any one particular point in time, you can do the math. The price of gold has risen considerably over uh, $1,400 uh, an ounce uh, since that time. And uh, But unfortunately, the national debt has uh, increased uh, significantly over time. So the, the numbers actually, uh, gold would have to be revalued at a much higher price than the current market price. Whether the market does that or whether the liquidation uh, officials do that is just a matter of uh, what actually would happen at the time. Uh, I suspect that you know Rothbard would just say, uh, take the national debt, clear it of its uh, assets that are canceling with the federal government, and then basically revalue the government's gold at whatever price is necessary uh, to basically cancel out all of the banknotes. And this is what happens in a regular bankruptcy court, is that you take the assets of the bankrupt entity and you put them out into the economy at a prorated basis. So if a company goes bankrupt and it has four creditors who have equal shares, uh, then you take whatever assets the company has after, and you just basically give each creditor uh, one quarter of those assets. Right. And Ron Paul suggested this during his two presidential campaigns, the point that Murray Rothbard makes here, which is that any treasury debt held by the Fed itself should just be immediately canceled. And right now that stands at about $5 trillion of the $27 trillion. So you do have a, 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 an almost immediate mechanism right there just canceled the debt that we supposedly owe to ourselves. But I, I think it's important to point out that the, the the U.S. government's debt is a different thing than the Fed unwinding itself and its, and its liabilities. I mean, we're talking about two different things. Here. Yes, that's right. But the magnitudes are very similar. Um, you know, the debt has increased, but the money supply uh, has also increased. So they're not the same thing, but they're roughly parallel in their magnitudes. Um, you know, the money supply is not... $27 trillion, uh, but it's increased significantly uh, just as the national debt has increased uh, significantly. And the fact that we're the central bank, the Federal Reserve is monetizing the debt now uh, means that that parallelism uh, has continued and that it will continue uh, 
until the political regime is changed and the political will of the American public has changed. Well, if you want to conceptualize maybe the unease you're feeling with what the Fed is doing, if you go to the St. Louis Fed's website, they call their it's called Fred. Uh, you can track the Fed's balance sheet, basically its liabilities. Uh, when again, when Rothbard writes this book, it's in the four hundred billions, and up until the crash of 07, 08, it only rises up to the six hundred billions. It's about seven hundred billion, I think, it, in 07. and then after the crash of 08, it spikes up to over four trillion dollars. So you know, many multiples, and it, and and uh, it it finally begins to taper off a little bit uh, in in recent years and gets down below four trillion. But then with COVID. And all the shutdowns of last year, it's it's again spiked up to over seven trillion dollars in less than a year. So, when you look at all that, Mark, and you think about the the money and credit creation, on it's just it's it's hard, I think, for average lay people to conceptualize. No, there's no question about it. Um, you know, the Fed has done a wonderful job in covering itself with the illusion of being great, and uh, you know, the numbers are so enormous that it, an average individual just is so out of touch with those kind of numbers. Uh, I think they're out of touch with the idea that we're going to pass a bill that's going to increase spending by uh, $1.9 trillion, and we're going to you know, increase the national debt by $1.9 trillion on just one vote of the Congress. Those numbers are beyond the average person's understanding. But you know, we're a big country, so numbers are naturally big. and. Um, but it all it all comes down back down to the basics of what Rothbard has discussed uh, throughout the case against the Fed. The you know over twenty five years the numbers have changed, but the principles are the same. You know, it wasn't that long ago that Fed officials, including Janet Yellen, did at least give lip service the idea of someday normalizing the Fed's balance sheet, which is which is another way of saying getting it back to pre crisis levels. So while there are people like Stephanie Kelton and Paul Krugman who are saying, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, debt and deficits don't matter, it seems today we have a new class of economists, a monetary economist, who is effectively saying that the Fed's balance sheet doesn't matter. Yeah, things have changed. Um, 25 years ago when Rothbard wrote this, there were battles within the Federal Reserve itself. There were hardcore monetary people running regional uh, federal, actual hawks. Yeah, actual hawks. Uh, who, well, not, not literal hawks. They were humans, but hawkish on, on the, the Fed's balance sheet. But now it's basically all ultra doves mm -hmm. uh, in terms of monetary policy. Janet Yellen is the ultimate dove. She doesn't see anything wrong with the Fed. She thinks that you know the Fed can do everything. Now she's at Treasury, so things are a little different. But uh, basically... Uh, the Fed has become nothing but a, a dovish inflationist monster, and the mainstream of economics um, has uh, changed in, in that same basic direction uh, where they think that the, the national debt doesn't matter, uh, the Fed uh, balance sheet doesn't matter. They see it as a tool of good. They see it as a tool of solving problems, and they don't, they don't want any constraints. Um, on the Fed or the Treasury to do to carry out these operations, basically they seem willingly unaware uh, of the problems that Rothbard discusses in this book. There's just basically no problem with with all these operations. They think they think it's normal, uh, basically, and that there's no downside uh, to it. And they, they, of course, they have to talk a good game. And so Yellen will always talk as well as. You know, people at the Federal Reserve, they'll always talk as if things will come back to normal in the near future. But right now, we're obligated to do this on behalf of the American people. Well, you know what else has become normal is former Fed chairs getting filthy rich after they leave. And this applied to Alan Greenspan and applied to Ben Bernanke. And we now find out it's also applied to Janet Yellen, who from Citadel LLC alone made over $800,000 in speaking fees. They're one of the hedge funds that came along and sort of helped recapitalize um, the, the, the hedge fund that lost so much shorting GameStop stock. So, you know, it, it really is an unholy story. Uh, nobody tells it better than Rothbard. Nobody tells it faster or more succinctly, I think. Uh, so the book is The Case Against the Fed, 
You can find it at Mises.org for free in both HTML and PDF formats. You can buy it for a measly seven bucks. And I really suggest you give this book a read. If you want to understand money, if you want to understand a little bit of history, and, and you want to have a sense of just how bizarre and extraordinary things really are, because, you know, 1994 sounds quaint right about now, especially when we look at the numbers. So all that said, Mark Thornton, I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to stick with our podcast every week. Keep reading these books. Keep informing yourself. And we'll be back next weekend with Patrick Newman talking about his new and upcoming book on the history of crony capitalism in early America. So stay tuned. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.